morning and welcome to our With Insight event. It's an absolute pleasure to have everyone here with us today. My name is Nikki Parker and I look after uh, marketing communications for Insight. Uh, today's With Insight is going to be a real special affair. We have Sally Sussman, who has joined us uh, from Pfizer. She's the Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer. She's Vice Chair of the Pfizer Foundation and Co-Chair of Pfizer's Political Action Committee. Sally leads engagement with all of Pfizer's external stakeholders, overseeing global policy, communications, government relations, investor relations, and the chief patient officer. Now, I'm sure as many of us sit here and reflect on the past 12, 14 months as we've dealt with COVID-19, the role that Sally and Pfizer have played in the development and rollout of the, one of the largest feats um, in recent medical history is truly astounding. And today we get the opportunity to listen to her about leadership during that period of time, but also her personal leadership that she has um, shown throughout her career, um, champion, championing advocacy for the LGBTQ plus community. So today, of course, we are celebrating one of the final days of Pride Month, um, and we're grateful to have Sally here to lend her voice to the business community, but also to that very important conversation. Today, Sally will be interviewed by Devin Parekh, Managing Director at Insight Partners. For those of you, and I can already see many of the names that have joined us at these uh, with Insight events before, he needs no introduction, but he will be leading us in the conversation today. Remember that we do have the Q&A feature that is available to you, so just pop in any of your questions that you have for Sally uh, in that, and as the conversation progresses towards the end, I'm sure Devin will be able to get to a few of those as well. But thank you so much for joining us. Devin and Sally, welcome to the stage. Hey, Sally, how are you? Good, Devin. Thank, thanks so much for having me today. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for being with us. You know, it's amazing when you kind of think back to March of last year, or even six months ago, that you and I would be having dinner in a crowded private room two weekends ago in a restaurant seemed like something that might not ever happen again. Um, maybe you could, we could start by taking us back to um, the, room, you know, the, the, the boardroom at Pfizer back in March of last year when we first heard about this kind of terrible disease. I remember that time so vividly. And you're right, it, it felt like a miracle that we ended up able to have dinner together two weeks ago. I was, was joyful. Uh, but in the you know, late February, early timeframe, March, uh, the WHO declares this pandemic. Um, and just in advance of that, the world is shutting down. Uh, you know, my, my daughter who's in California was in a hot spot. Um, I'm walking around the city and seeing the shelves thin out. And I think, is this New York City? Is this possible? And Pfizer was um, powering down our global headquarters, which is at uh, 42nd Street, right near um, Grand Central Station, you know, the hubbub of Midtown. We're powering down the company, the country, the world. And Pfizer uh, declares a very bold ambition that we're gonna do three things as a company. First, to take care of our 90,000 employees around the world. I mean, really care for them. Second, to maintain a steady stream of medicine to the clinics and hospitals and doctor's offices around the world because you know cancer didn't go away during COVID. So the, lots of demands on the healthcare system. But ultimately, goal number three was the, the magic ticket that we said we were gonna bring a vaccine forward this year to, to beat back COVID-19, a, a goal that usually takes eight to 10 years, 12 years in eight months. So look, I know you're not a scientist, don't claim to be a scientist, um, but it's amazing the innovation that's happening in life sciences. So what, again, at a high level, mm -hmm. what made it possible for Pfizer to partner with uh, BioNTech uh, to deliver uh, a vaccine so quickly. Obviously, Moderna also delivered a vaccine, uh, but what, what, what made that happen? No, thank you. Um, it's something I think about every day, what made that happen? And you're very kind uh, to acknowledge I'm not a scientific expert, but I am a student of leadership and business and you know, innovation. 
Um, and there are many, many things that uh, could answer your question, but I remember the Wall Street Journal did a retrospective on the whole situation. They followed us from the beginning. We, we gave the journal tremendous access and they were gonna write a, a TikTok about how this all came to be. And their headline was, you know, Pfizer brings forward vaccine in record time, crazy deadlines and a pushy CEO. And I think when you hard boil it, it under crazy deadlines is the idea of thinking so big. You know, if Albert Borla, our fantastic CEO had said, can we do this uh, vaccine in six years? We would have had incremental improvement. But when he said something so audacious of, can we do it in eight months? We'll, we're gonna do it in eight months. You know, the, the faces of the scientists fell on the Zoom, the manufacturing guys, their heads were blowing off. Um, but it was the statement of such a bold ambition. You know, we like to call it making the impossible possible. Um, it was, that was a big element to it. And um, the second thing is this notion of a pushy CEO. You know, um, we, the way that we met every day on this project at 5 p.m. We called it Project Light Speed. So every night at 5 p.m., everybody would get on the call. There, there was, we crushed hierarchy. So it wasn't like just the bosses are on the call, but the people who were actually doing the work. The project manager was Albert Borla, the CEO, which in big companies is rare, very rare, but he was the project manager. And these calls, you would bring your problems, your hurdles, your new information. And the call would sometimes last an hour. It could often last two, three hours. There was shouting, laughter, tears. Uh, it, but it was that sort of breaking through at every single element. I mean, I, I can go on about this for several hours, but um, and I we, hope only, we, can... we only have one hour. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I'll pa I'll pause there. But if I had to say the two things, that would be it. I, I don't believe Pfizer would have had this vaccine without Albert Borla. You know, the amazing thing when you, and obviously there's been a lot written about Pfizer, but also a lot written about Moderna. And, you know, the amazing thing is that the actual, you know, virus, uh, because of the technology, the, effectively the DNA gets decoded really quickly. Um, and the vaccine got created in a matter of kind of weeks. But then you have a long process uh, or relatively long process to actually get it approved. Now, in, in, in your case, uh, and you also do government affairs, you have to deal with um, DC a fair amount, you had to deal with two administrations. Um, and I don't want to turn this into a kind of a political conversation, but I think it's an interesting just story about what were the contrasts. Obviously, in the first case, you were dealing with getting a drug approved and then, and then starting the distribution. In the second case, the actual distribution. Can you just talk a little bit about what that was like? I'd be happy to. I, I first just want to make one uh, reflection on your comment about Pfizer and Moderna, um, because the two dif the difference for these two companies was the selection of mRNA technology, as opposed to traditional live virus vaccine technology, allowing both companies to move forward very quickly and ahead of the curve. You know what's interesting to me about that, and maybe to the to the people on this Zoom is for Moderna, this was the first drug they ever made, okay? They've never made a product before and kudos to them for, you know, starting with such a big success. Pfizer is a 178 year old company um, that was, you know, founded in Brooklyn and made penicillin. And I sort of say kudos to us for, for acting like a startup when that was what was required. So just an interesting aside about, about that. But to your question about the, the government relations in the two administrations, this was government relations on steroids. I mean, we had heads of state calling us regularly. And, you know, Bibi Netanyahu's calling, Boris Johnson's calling, Macron, Merkel, everybody, because it was sort of a, a free for all for government leaders trying to secure their doses. You know, um, Kudos and credit to the Trump administration for creating Operation Warp Speed and putting significant funding behind the effort. 
Six companies belong to Operation Warp Speed. Pfizer belonged to the, the collective, but we took no money from the government. And it, we were the only ones who didn't take money from the government. And frankly, I, it annoyed them. It annoyed them a lot because they wanted to be the investors, the backers. And we felt that if we took the money, inevitably there would be strings attached in terms of how to run the clinical trials, how to procure the component parts. And we wanted full liberation for our scientists and, and for our, our effort, but we didn't want to stiff arm the Trump administration. So we stayed in the dialogue um, of Operation Warp Speed. You know, in the end, I, I think the fact that they supported all six companies equally slowed up the United States a bit. Um, they ordered originally 100 million doses from each of the companies, um, but not everyone was able to deliver that. Pfizer did deliver that very quickly. And once uh, the administration changed hands, the Biden people were um, very skilled at um, uh, accelerating the process, more frequent order delivery discussion. Uh, they, came, they came forward very, very quickly, bought more doses, um, and we were very honored that President Biden made his first trip as president of the United States in this country to Kalamazoo, Michigan, to the Pfizer factory. And I, I was fortunate to be there that day when we greeted him. It was very, very moving. So yes, deep government relations with all, um, all parties, all players, and um, great success in working with the Biden administration. So as you think about, as you think about the um, distribution uh, because obviously it's amazing where we are today, but if you go back even just six months ago, uh, our, distrib our, our vaccine rates were kind of exceedingly low. Um, what, what changed so quickly? Well, uh, um, the Biden team did accelerate um, the distribution process, more frequent engagement with the governors who were key um, and, you know, um, increasing the, the order uh, from Pfizer, which allowed us to deliver more. Um, but, you know, the part of the reason that people, the vaccination rate struggled, it was only in part distribution. It was distribution in the beginning, Devin, you're right about that. But then ultimately it became vaccine hesitancy. And that's where we are today. Today in the United States, supply exceeds demand for the vaccine. And I think maybe yesterday you might've seen that um, the US government has started exporting US doses that they own uh, to countries in need. So the, the issue was distribution. There were initial challenges. You know, in the beginning we had to ship at minus 70 Celsius. That was not easy. Um, and, but we mastered that, we improved that. Now we can ship and deliver just into regular pharmacy refrigerators. So it, many of the kinks have been worked out of those early distribution challenges. But when you look at the country, you still have this relatively large disparity, both based on somewhat socioeconomic, somewhat racial, somewhat geographic, sadly, somewhat political, um, where you've got portions of the country that obviously have very high vaccination rates and portions of the country and groups that have low vaccination rates. And now with the Delta variant, uh, kind of coming through, what do you think we can do to try to change the game on the vaccine hesitancy? I mean, one of the observations I was talking, I won't name them, but a well-known sports, uh, well-known athlete um, who obviously had every ability to get a vaccine um, wasn't vaccinated. And many, many, many people that he knew that were in a similar position were not vaccinated. I was encouraging him to go on Instagram. You should get, not only should you get vaccinated, you should get vaccinated on Instagram. Um, um, but there's still this hesitancy that exists in many communities. What, what, what do you think we can do to kind of change the game? I think a lot about this. And from the beginning, my fear was nothing would be more tragic than to have a vaccine that people didn't have the confidence to take. And knowing that it was going to be new technology, an accelerated timeline against the backdrop of a terrifying uh, pandemic that was also frightening people, that the, the lift to building confidence, the, the hurdle would be high. And frankly, that's, that's why I, as a chief communicator, was involved in the 
you know, in the core team because there was so many kind of public components to it. Some of the things we did was increase our transparency. So for example, we publicized the protocols of our clinical trial. Usually in a pharma company, this is top secret information. This is intellectual property kept under lock and key. But because we knew we were gonna have to really win the day about the quality of the vaccine, we published this protocol data from the beginning. And then when the vaccine started coming out and we faced the kind of hesitancy that you, you mentioned, geographic, socioeconomic, racial, political, um, we tested deeply the messages that were most effective and the messengers that were most effective. And um, the messages have to do with um, simplifying things. It isn't really a science argument that wins the day so much as the emotional argument. Do you want your kids to see their grandparents? Do you want to be able for your kids to go to school? Do you want your neighborhood local businesses to be able to thrive? So, so some of the more humanistic um, arguments worked well. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to contradict your idea about your celebrity sports friend, but um, what our research showed is the politicians, the celebrities, the superstars are less influential than the teacher, the preacher, the local doctor, the lady next door. Very similar to feel like, feels like politics, if you know, it's both of yeah. us involved in politics to some degree. And it's, it's the biggest influence is your friends and, and the people you're close to, not you know, a, a superstar. Yeah, you, you're so right. And like politics, um, another big influence was social media, particularly people posting on Instagram. The, I got my shot, the pride, the hugs. Um, I, I was really taken by every time someone got a vaccine and would, would pose a triumphant photo with their nurse. It was great. Um, so we've talked a lot about the U.S. and We've made progress here. Let's talk about the rest of the world for a minute, and then we'll move on to some other topics. Um, obviously, you've got many parts of the world where vaccine, vaccination rates are incredibly low, and places like India where vaccination rates are low, and, and you've got um, disease, disease rates that are pretty high. What's your kind of prognosis uh, for, I was talking to somebody in Asia t this morning, um, and I said, and they, they have a lot of investments in India. And he said, I don't know if I'll be able to spend much time in India for the next couple of years. So as you kind of think about the rest of the world, when do you think the rest of the world might look more like what we're feeling like today? Mm, such an important question. And forgive a, a Pfizer plug, but we have uh, four corporate values, courage, excellence, equity, and joy. And equity is not something you often see on a big pharma company list of values, but we, we wrote that into our values a year before the pandemic, knowing that healthcare disparities is an explosive and dangerous topic. Um, so right now, today, it is incumbent upon all of us working in the first world healthcare system to find a way to vaccinate the rest of the world. And, um, you know, it was very interesting to me that President Biden recently secured 500 million doses from Pfizer uh, to go to low and low middle income countries. Um, we also have a program to help vaccinate people in refugee settings because it won't end until, you know, what is it, seven and a half billion people in the world are vaccinated. And, you know, what we see with these strains is that, you know, it's still a struggle to get herd immunity. And you don't necessarily feel that if you're here in New York City where things seem so so great, but the threat remains very real. The, the adage is true that no one is safe until everyone is safe. You know, um, the fact that we, I can't travel to England to see my goddaughter and my, my family that lives in England can't come here to see us is, is an indication that as a global world, where travel, transport, everything continues to move around the globe so quickly, we have to work together, all the companies, um, not just some of the companies, but all the companies who have manufacturing capacity working together. You know, I think you're gonna see manufacturing capacity come into places like India 
in other com countries where they maybe didn't discover the drug, but can the vaccine, but can produce it. Gates is helping, the WHO is helping. And we have to remember that the only common enemy we have is the virus. And it isn't a competition between Pfizer and J&J &J or AstraZeneca and Moderna. It's competition between the world and the virus. So how do you think this last 18 months changed Pfizer? Profoundly, dramatically. Um, you know, in, in so many ways. I mean, first, we believe that the future of medicine has changed. On uh, Sunday, November 8th, when I was in our small office in Connecticut, and we were awaiting the results of our trial, did, did the vaccine work or not? Our chief medical officer, when he heard the news of 90 plus percent effective, he said, oh my God, it's the biggest medical advance in a hundred years. And it isn't Pfizer's alone. I mean, Moderna and others will use mRNA, but if we can do this in eight months, what else can we do in eight months? You know, move forward, rare disease treatments, oncology treatment, and really shape shift uh, the, whole, the whole process of drug discovery. And then for me more personally, you know, I, I worked at two other companies before I came to Pfizer, American Express and Estee Lauder companies both have great reputations. And Pfizer had a lousy reputation when I came to the company. And I, that's why I came to the company because they make life-saving medicine. How can they have a bad reputation? And I spent more than a decade understanding the problem, trying to fix it. Like to think I made some, some minor progress, but the pandemic and our response to the pandemic changed everything. And it, we went from being you know, a much unloved company to being a top 10 global brand. And so I just feel enormous pride and we feel pride at being able to be a leading company. Well, congratulations on, on this is an amazing story. Um, but let's you. talk about your story. Uh, you kind of touched on uh, Estee Lauder and Amex, but maybe you can talk about just your journey of how you got here. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, growing up, like most young people, I wanted to do good in the world. I thought I might be a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist or maybe the mayor of my hometown, St. Louis. Uh, I didn't land in either politics or journalism, but fortunate to find a career pathway that speaks to both my interests in both of those things. Um, I work in corporate affairs. It's, it's something I love. It's really bridge building between companies and their various stakeholders. And as stakeholders became more aggressive, more skilled, thanks to uh, the internet, social media, a stakeholder mentality, I found that the work I did became um, very central. I I report to the CEO of my company. I sit next to him and I practiced this first at American Express where I did it both in, um, in the US and in Europe, eight or nine years with the Lauder family and their public company. And now the last 14 years at Pfizer. And it's been just a great joy to, to work in these companies. I did spend a brief amount of time in government and um, I found that it wasn't as easy to make change there as I had hoped. And I developed a theory or a belief that if you really wanna make change, the private sector is not a bad place to do it from. And why do you think, what do you think it is that's structural about government that makes it so hard to have things happen quickly or at all sometimes? Well, for me, the years that I spent in Washington, at first I did two tours, <clears throat> excuse me, one in the United States Senate as a staffer, and then again uh, in the Clinton administration, working for Ron Brown in the Commerce Department. In the first instance, it was just gridlock. I mean, it was just political gridlock, a divided um, House and Senate. Um, you know, the second time I went back because I thought things would work um, more quickly, but the the energy is hard to muster. Um, change is hard to, to drive. I mean, one of my great accomplishments was a piece of legislation where I changed an or to an and. And while you probably know that can sometimes be meaningful, it's not entirely gratifying. 
Um, but when I moved to private sector, I could do things like help bring forward same-sex partner benefits at American Express ahead of the government. Private sector moves fast. And I mean, if you have followed what the Business Roundtable did with their um, new definition of a company, I think it was last year. Yep. And it, you know, it's not just for the, it's for the shareholder, but it's also for the employees and other customers and stakeholders. I like that theory. I, I find it's um, an interesting place from which to drive positive change. So you're, you're at these three kind of well-known iconic uh, companies. You talked a little bit about Albert's role from a leadership standpoint. Are, are there some common themes around leadership uh, that you would draw from those three companies that you saw in the leadership of all three of those companies? Sure. Um, in the three great companies and nine CEOs um, over the course of my career, three at each, um, you know, I, I think that leadership really matters. Um, and there, some of those nine leaders were stronger than others. And the ones that were the strongest really tied their company to a purpose. And the purpose isn't always, of course, it isn't always the same. Um, American Express did a lot of great things for hunger um, and for you know, uh, people who were homeless and hungry. They had great uh, cause marketing. Um, you know, Estee Lauder did a tremendous amount to help women and customers around self-esteem and health, breast health. And then, you know, Pfizer now breakthroughs that change patients' lives. I think the, the leaders who really marry the work every day to some kind of larger purpose, let people hook their wagons to bigger stars, and it is just, you know, essential, really, really essential. And so how do you, you know, we're in a world where there's so much focus on shareholder return, right? At the same time, we talk about all these other issues. How, how, does, how does one as a CEO uh, deliver on both? Deliver on driving the shareholder return, but also kind of having that larger vision that might not, sometimes might not be totally consistent with shareholder return. So I believe it is consistent with shareholder return. Um, and so, for example, as the head of the Pfizer Foundation and doing a lot of our corporate responsibility, I am often providing the access programs to get our medicines to the poor. And it's expen these are expensive programs. And you might say, well, you know, how is that really helping shareholder value if you're doing these things that cost money, there's, there's no return, or delivering medicines in, mar in countries where there'll never be a thriving market. But I believe if we don't do these things, we could potentially lose our entire right to do business. Um, you know, the, the anger that exists against the pharmaceutical companies in previous times and probably will return again is great. Um, the, the feeling when people feel that they can't afford their medicine or that rich kids are getting different medicine than poor kids um, is an unsustainable social pressure. And if not addressed, I, I think you know, we could lose the entire, the entire institution of private medicine, um, of an ability to, Pfizer invests $10 billion a year in our R&D pipeline. We put $2 billion at risk in our COVID activities. All of this rests on having a strong, profitable company that yes, delivers to shareholders, but without, I think without an expression of our social conscience, it, it is not a guaranteed future for these companies. And you only have to look around the world to see that's true and you end up with a very different um, healthcare delivery system. So it's, uh, so it's Pride Month. Uh, yeah. And um, you know, it was funny when we were getting ready for this, I thought, and we had the quick call a few weeks ago, I was like, I, I felt like I had to ask you whether it was okay to talk about this. And it reminded me of the issue um, because it really shouldn't be something that I need to ask you about because it should be acceptable to talk about it. Um, and obviously you've been pretty public about it. So it'd be, you talked about your kind of career arc, but maybe you can talk a little bit about coming out and what was it like that for you? I think you did it relatively early. 
Well, first of all, thank you um, for your you know, sensitive way in which you approach this with me personally. And thank you for giving me this platform uh, with so many influential people on the line to talk about something that I still believe is an issue in 2021, although it, it sometimes feels hard to believe, but it, it very much is. I came out in 1984. Um, I had just graduated from college and I told my folks that uh, I was gay and it was a very difficult moment. Um, you know, my, my parents who I love, my father, who's my role model said to me through tears, you'll never have a spouse, children or a career. And he said that not, not to be hurtful, these were his parental fears talking. And, you know, this was back in the time when it was still grounds for a teacher to be fired if they knew that they were gay. Um, there were still discriminatory laws on the books and lots of um, social pressure and these topics were still taboo. I believe that to have been the most liberating moment in my life, um, one that set me on a course where I was going to get those three things if it killed me, a spouse, a, a daughter, and a, and a career, and allowed me to be part of a movement. The gay civil rights movement in this country has been rapid. And things that were unimaginable to me then, you know, that I'm married uh, to my partner of 33 years and my wife since whenever it became legal, you know, that um, I have a daughter who doesn't even know why I talk about this. She thinks it's completely not a topic um, and, and a career where I could even argue that potentially being a openly gay person was an asset. There's a, a book written by celebrity stylist, Andrew Gelwicks that came out last year called The Queer Advantage. And his argument is, and is that people who come out and have the ability to speak openly, to be authentic, to make genuine relationships have a bit of a leg up in, um, in their careers just because of that courage and authenticity. So it's, it's certainly gone well. There were bumpy moments. Do you mind, Devin, if I tell the story I told you? Please. Okay, okay. Um, you know, you asked me, can we talk about this? And I guess it, unlike um, other differences, it isn't necessarily obvious if a person is gay. And when I was interviewing at the Estee Lauder companies, I'd had many interviews with many family members and executives. It is the person who would be the spokeswoman for their family business, the company that their grandmother founded. And I was having one of the very last interviews um, with a senior member of, of the Lauder family, Ronald Lauder. And you know, I was excited, I was nervous, I knew I was close. And because it was Lauder, I, you know, all dressed up, makeup, hair, the whole thing. And I am escorted into this magnificent office museum quality art on the wall. And he's very friendly, Ronald Lauder, he comes over, we sit down and, and he must have observed that I, I wear a small band on my finger and his opening gambit of getting to know you was, so tell me, what does your husband do? And with that, his assistant barges into the room and tells him that uh, there's a, the prime minister of Israel was on the phone for him. So I offered to step out so he could have privacy in his office. And he says, oh, no, no, I'll take it in the conference room. And he steps into the conference room to take the call with the prime minister for what was probably 10 or 12 minutes and felt like an eternity to me where I am having a biggest fight with myself, lecturing myself. I, I was out at the time, I was coming out but it wouldn't necessarily be the first thing I would have wanted to say to someone in a job interview. But I also knew that he'd thrown something down that I needed to respond to and in, to respond to it in a very particular way. You know, he might've forgotten about it given he was chatting with the prime minister, but, but I didn't forget about it. So when he came and sat back down, you know, I, I tried to put on my, my warmest smile and to say to him how much I appreciated his interest in getting to know me personally and how fortunate I was and am to have a wonderful partner and that she and I had been together a long time and that 
she was really um, an essential factor in my success. And that together we were building a family with our daughter. And um, I thanked him again for asking me the question. And I paused. And I thought, it's a good time to just run from the building now. <laughs> and his response was, he stopped for a minute. I think he looked at me differently. And he offered me the job on the spot saying, you will be a gracious and lovely communicator on behalf of our company. You know, welcome, welcome to the family and to the business. And, uh, you know, it's just a story I've never forgotten and one that I keep with me. So thank you for letting me tell it. So you, so you, that's one obviously where you turned what felt like an awkward situation. It ended up being an asset by you being open, but are there examples where it didn't quite work out that way? What, what are examples? Because I feel like I'm sure there's some people on the phone who, who maybe are thinking about this or thinking about whether or not they want to come out. What, and they're worried about the downside case. What, what, what happens when the person says that they don't offer you the job? So what have been those challenges that you've dealt with in your life? Oh, yes. <laughs> there have been many, many downsides. Maybe a couple um, of those stories, just because <laughs> I think it's just helpful for people to understand. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think you ever know fully the opportunities you didn't get because someone might have suspected something about you that they didn't feel comfortable with. But um, I had two incidents that were difficult for me. Um, the first one was when I went to work for President uh, Clinton, it was the first time that I had ever been subject to a background check by the Secret Service. And I wasn't fully out and I, I could tell that this was gonna be a problem for me. And um, again, it wasn't a story of something that went terribly wrong because I, I don't think in the end, these things go terribly wrong. There's just an awful lot of anxious nights, sleepless nights and, and deep worry and stress that one endures when you know in these moments. And I really wasn't prepared to, to fully come out at that time. But I knew that the problem wasn't so much going to be necessarily being homosexual. The problem was going to be having a secret. And the secret is what makes you vulnerable to- Blackmail, you know, yeah. Right. right. So you know, I, st I stumbled my way through that one. And, and I did come out, but it wasn't nearly as elegant as the story I told yeah. first. And the other time was um, when I was with American Express and they offered me a position to run corporate affairs in Europe. And I don't know about you, but you know, who doesn't want to work in Europe and um, have that opportunity when you're young in your career. Um, and I signed up for the job, but I didn't realize that my partner wasn't going to be able to come, come along with me on my visa. Um, our daughter was one, we'd been together a long time, but I had failed to, to understand that there was no, at this point, and these, these were in the um, late eighties, that there was no reciprocal domestic partner, anything, okay? It wasn't American Express's fault and they couldn't fix it. Um, in the end, um, again, many sleepless nights, much more stress than I wanted to carry at that time for just moving my family to another country. Ultimately, the only way I could take the job was for my wife to find her own job and get her own visa, which she did because she's spectacular. But, you know, it, it made for a tough time for us and a shorter duration of our overseas assignment uh, because it was never the plan for her to be working night and day and me to be working night and day and for her to have to manage her own immigration status. So... In the end, you know, there, I don't have a story so much of failure as a story of struggle. Um, and I do believe that ultimately most of these struggles work out, uh, but the goal is to reduce the struggle for people as leaders and to welcome them as you are, Devin. So, so what is, what's your advice for people who haven't come out or thinking of coming out and not sure how to do it, not comfortable? Um, like, what's your advice for them? I, I'd like to offer advice to them, but I'd also like to offer advice to their straight bosses and colleagues. And um, to the that straight- was gonna be, That was going to be my oh, next question, but okay. it's okay. 
<laughs> you can do I'm it glad we're, we're on the same wavelength. Um, so first to the bosses and the colleagues, um, first and foremost, don't assume. Don't assume anyone is gay or straight or, or any of the other uh, sexual orientation choices by trans that people are. Um, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and the assumptions can be, can be painful. And the second advice for people, um, our allies, is to make space. You know, make space for people. Um, ask those questions. Because sometimes people know, but they think, oh, I don't want to ask because they'll be embarrassed. I think most people welcome an open door. You know, if you're having an event and, and spouses are included, make sure partners are included. And, you know, don't like really make the ex really ask the extra question to, to get to the answer. And for my fellow LGBTQ people, um, I, I would just say that the pain of living in the closet is greater than any other pain you might be experiencing in my view. And, you know, uh, it took years for my father uh, to really speak with me in a, in a relaxed way. Um, you know, the family events were, were extremely difficult. Um, you know, my wife and I weren't seated together at my brother's wedding. Um, you know, there was lots and lots of difficult moments, um, but they, they ultimately were necessary for, to get to the place that I think all of us want to get to. As I, one of the things that we try to do out of these events is try to make all of this as you know, concrete as possible so that people come out of it and say, you know, here's specific kind of things I can do. And so maybe we can use Pfizer as kind of an example. When you kind of think about the initiatives that you have in place around um, LGBTQ issues or people, um, what are they? What are, what are there specific things that you feel like you, you guys are doing as a company uh, to make people feel to make people feel welcome. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in addition to mentioning our, our four values earlier, um, where I wanted to kind of land on equity, uh, this time I'd sort of like to land on joy. And um, I, I think that joy around issues of diversity and inclusion, equity is very important. You know, for the first time, Pfizer started flying the gay flag during June Pride Month at all of our facilities. Um, we also started flying recently the Black Lives Matter flag. And it, it isn't just, of course, about flying flags. I don't want to trivialize it. But I do want to say it's a celebration of our difference, not a tolerating, a tolerating our differences. And I, I think as this discussion has progressed over the decades, in the beginning, a lot of this discussion was about you know, pay and benefits and equity. Um, and, and some of the, 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 the grittier things, but I, I think we've matured as a society and including things about the joy um, and being able to, to laugh together. I mean, the other day um, I was with my CEO, Albert Borla, and um, we were meeting with a member of the Biden cabinet and the Biden cabinet member said to Albert, oh, it's great to see you guys. Uh, Sally's a big fan of yours. And he goes, I'm a big fan of hers too, but I'd marry her, except she already married Robin. You know, I mean, it was, it was just, it yeah. was a silly thing, but it speaks to not being fearful yeah. to talk about these things. Not that not the, everything doesn't have to be in, in politically correct speech or in right, perfectly right. constructed well, memos. I'm, I, well, I'm happy you raised that topic because I think for, for, I think for the bosses, um, I think it's something that they worry about. So for example, that comment, I would have been incredibly nervous to make that comment. Um, and obviously the two of you are really close um, and have that type of rapport. Uh, but being in the same situation, I, my first reaction would be, well, I'm gonna get in trouble with HR or you know, somebody could file a complaint. And you know, we're living in a very kind of politically charged time. And so it, it feels like it's a hard thing sometimes for people to kind of create that, the same joke you might make with a friend who's, um, that you, you don't feel comfortable making anymore because you're worried about what the reaction is going to be. I, I hear you. And um, I would never want to leave this conversation with people thinking I was, you know, encouraging in inappropriate or insensitive speaking, but nor, nor do I want you to feel silenced by the pressures of a woke society. And, you know, um, we have to be able 
to come together as people and enjoy one another's company and, and welcome each other into our lives. And, and I'm, I'm strongly encouraging these things <clears throat> right now. And um, especially as society reopens and there are opportunities to get together. You know, I, I think if, if we can carefully extend those opportunities to ensure that, you know, whether someone's differently able, whether they have a different home life, that they're warmly re-embraced is really important right now. So, let, let, I mean, let's talk a little bit about recruiting because obviously I think the, the positive about what's happened over the last, you know, 12 or 18 months post George Floyd and others is I think there is a genuine focus on diversity. Uh, at least I've seen a difference, uh, a significant difference in, in the companies, whether that be at the board level, whether that be, you know, in, in our companies, more of our companies are reporting mm -hmm. their diversity, some publicly. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is if you're trying to, if you're trying to diverse, if you're trying to recruit, say, I'll use myself, an Indian person, you kind of, it's easy to know whether a person's Indian or not. Um, but if you say, I want to try to, I want to increase my diversity around, say, LGBTQ, unless somebody self-identifies, uh, you're not really going to know. So as you think about the recruiting process to increase diversity for kind of all different types of people, say, and we can use Pfizer as an example. How do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right that the George Floyd murder really seems to have, you know, made the conversation a constant and not sort of a, oh, this horrific thing happened, but then we just went back to our day lives. And, and perhaps, you know, COVID played a part in that and that we were quieter and we were home and we were traveling, watching the news more closely. And I've asked myself frequently, how do you make that not just a moment, but a movement? And in addition to the continuous, courageous and candid conversations, we have become much more transparent about our, um, our representation goals. And that is for primarily uh, racial minorities, but it's increasingly including LGBT members. I mean, I saw that the state of California, and I believe it's the NASDAQ as well, have um, required greater diversity on boards. And I know you're fielding a lot of people for yep. a lot of boards. Yep. Um, and they included LGBTQ in that. And, you know, yes, it, it may be harder to identify. And there are pools where you can go fishing for great LGBT people like forums like the Victory Fund or the Human Rights Campaign and sponsor their events or, you know, participate in some of their activities. Um, or you can just ask me because I know a lot of them. <laughs> you might get a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. I know in a, in a deep well of, of highly talented LGBTQ leaders who would be honored uh, to have a chance to work in your companies or serve on your boards. Um, it would be great. So what, what do you think at this point the role of government is as it relates to LGBTQ? So now you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're happily married and officially married. Uh, which is obviously a, a much needed but long incoming change. Um, what else do you think needs to happen? Well, I, I think that we need to maintain the gains that we have achieved. And I really worry about that, um, specifically around uh, parenting. You know, the, um, the, I'm not an expert on, I'm not an, a science expert and I'm not a, a legal expert, but the, the rights that have been won in the courts for LGBTQ people to marry, um, to foster children. Uh, many of us, like myself, have, have children through adoption. Um, adoption rights, often those begin in fostering rights. Those, I feel, are, are, remain at risk, even though great gains have been made. And so both through the laws and through the courts, keeping those um, kinds of, of rights is very, very important. Um, and so, you know, what I, I always like to uh, end on this note, which is what's, what's the kindest thing anybody's ever done for you? Oh, wow. That is such a wonderful question. I think, you know, in the spirit of our discussion about coming out and, and being candid, you know, I think the kindest thing anyone has ever really done for me is to be truthful with me. Um, to have the faith in me and in our friendship uh, to tell me things sometimes that are 
occasionally hard to hear, whether that's a friend on a beach walk who will share something um, or, you know, a boss who might uh, give honest, real feedback and not just your great feedback. Um, I think taking the time uh, to be truly honest with one another is a great gift. And certainly I've benefited from that throughout my life from my parents, my friends, my colleagues. Thank you. So I one question that's come up, which is unrelated to what we're talking about, is people want to know whether or not Pfizer is going to have to give people boosters uh, because of the Delta variant. What's your, uh, mm -hmm. this, it's a question that came in the Q&A, so I just wanted to hit it before we, uh, we finished up. Of course, everybody yeah. wants to know. Yeah. Um, we are currently testing against all the variants. Um, and our vaccine is holding up very, very well and continuing to provide protection. But that said, it is in our estimation that somewhere in the range of 10, 12 months out, boosters may be recommended. And do you think this will be like a flu vaccine where we take it every year? I think it could be. And it could be the kind of thing that includes a lot of things beyond COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, the M MNRA could be the platform and you could be getting your, your flu shot or your you know, your Lyme's disease shot or, you know, whatever. Right. It, that's just part of the exciting part of it. So I, I do think we will be getting more vaccines more regularly. And that's a great thing because you're never a patient with a vaccine. You're just a person. You're not sick yet. And that's, that's really the goal is, is not to treat people once they're sick, but prevent their illness and their suffering. Well, Sally, thank you so much. We'll probably take you up on your offer on talent. Uh, okay, good. Look, look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, thank okay, you, Devin. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.